at the Halsey Institute of Contemporary Art. Tonight's discussion between Lonnie Holly and Dr. Ted Rosengarten is the 10th and final installment in a series of in-conversation events that we've hosted over this fall and winter in conjunction with our virtual exhibition, Displacements, Revisitations of Home. Displacements may be experienced at displacements.org. Displacements, Revisitations of Home features the work of 10 artists who were asked to submit work that speaks to their own reflections on the meaning of home. Each artist was paired with a writer who responded to the body of work with an essay. Recordings of all conversation events, including this one, are available at displacements.org after the fact, as well as archived on the Halsey Institute's Facebook page. We invite you to participate in the Displacements Project by visiting the Engage tab on the website. There, you'll find a phone number you can call to leave a message sharing your own stories of home, as well as a map where you can add your home alongside those of others. On the website, you'll also find a Resources tab. There, you can download a teaching packet that you can complete on your own with children or share with an educator you know. Programs like this one are made possible by the support of our amazing members and fans. Please consider donating to our end of year camp giving campaign to ensure a future full of adventurous art for all. Tonight, I'm so pleased to introduce displacements artist Lonnie Holly and his respondent, Ted Rosengarten. Lonnie Holly has devoted his life to the practice of improvisational creativity. His work incorporates natural and man-made objects already imbued with cultural and artistic associations into narrative sculptures that commemorate places, people, and events. Lonnie joins us this evening from Atlanta, Georgia. Ted, Ted Rosengarten is a historian who has produced significant research on both African-American life and culture, as well as Jewish culture. He recently retired from his position as the Zucker Goldberg Chair of Holocaust Studies at the College of Charleston. And Ted joins us this evening from McClellanville, South Carolina. We invite you to ask any questions you have for Lonnie or Ted by entering them in the Facebook comments for this video, or by emailing halsey at cfc.edu. Many thanks to both of you, Ted and Lonnie, for your time this evening. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you, Katie. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lonnie, for this opportunity for us to uh, talk and uh, work together again. Lonnie and I have worked uh, quite a bit together over the last five years. We've traveled together to uh, Alabama where uh, Lonnie was from and where I've done uh, probably my most important work. Um, and we had a great time. It's actually visiting some of Lonnie's old home sites. Um, and I want to begin this evening, uh, not by, and we will get to really look at Lonnie's work, but by hearing Lonnie and, but hearing him specifically through his music. Uh, Lonnie is a wonderful musician and I guess you call him songwriter, lyricist, uh, as well as a fine uh, artist. And um, we're gonna start, I think, and I'll ask uh, Katie to uh, cue it up with, uh, one, with probably his first major recording, uh, a terrific number called uh, All, All Rendered Truth. And you could say that this is a document that uh, records uh, one of the most uh, sort of significant evictions from a home that Lonnie uh, ever faced when he, in fact, uh, had a, a, a large, what I would call outdoor studio space uh, uh, adjacent to the Birmingham, uh, uh, Birmingham airport. And uh, I, I'll think I'll let Lonnie, we'll listen to it and then let Lonnie tell us a little bit about how that uh, came about. So it's a really a fantastic piece. So Katie, could you... Uh, can we run that? Yes, here we go. 
looking for all to be rendered looking for all to come about from my soul looking for all somewhere within one day it all began I was needing oh so bad all my goodness to show and one day one day at my lowest at my lowest I know that day I need it all to show Looking for all, looking for all Looking for all to show I call upon myself Call upon myself to do my best all upon myself I was looking for all, all to be rendered to be the truth from deep inside of my internal self and I told everybody I say art is to me And the T is for true, and the I is for infernal, and the S is for sad. Looking for all, looking for all, all to be rendered for the truth from humankind, from an internal place in me I, from an internal place that I call myself. You can hear, hear that song in its entirety on YouTube where about 130,000 people have uh, tuned in to hear it and, and, and really follow Lonnie's progression as a musician uh, uh, on that site. Um, I, I would say just from that, that excerpt that who could have ever guessed that 20 years almost to the day when uh, Lonnie was, uh, Lonnie's outdoor studio, we can call that the great studio space, was bulldozed by the city of uh, Birmingham. 20 years after that, his pieces, his pieces of artwork uh, were purchased by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and that his art had been and was being shown uh, in Philadelphia, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Atlanta, uh, and uh, it really a kind of a meteoric rise of uh, an artist who was uh, kind of at living and working kind of at the margins uh, of society. And I want to ask Lonnie to start. Lonnie, what changed in those 20 years? What changed about your art? And what do you think changed in society that kind of uh, encouraged the sort of acceptance that you and your work have had? Well, if I could say anything to encourage other artists that actually have the intention to, no matter what, when or where, or uh, whatever means there are for them to be the artist that they uh, intend to be, just continue to be the artist and continue to be persistent with what you do. I just like to say, 
thanks to William Arnett. Uh, this is uh, this show can be dedicated to him as far as I'm concerned because he actually took my art under his wings and and took care of them, promoted them, documented them, cataloged a lot of the pieces, and actually put them in circulation. My works are uh, at the United Nation in the Smithsonian. They've been there for years now. Uh, information doesn't mean that you have to have a work of art, a photograph or a picture of a piece of art, or a painting of a piece of art on a wall. You can be in a book. And that's what the Housing Institute has allowed to happen for me and Ted were, uh, you Ted were the person that read about me, you came around and you read, you inspected my way of living and you saw how I was living on beyond the hurt and the, the stress that I had to bear mentally from a uh, movement or uh, having my home destroyed with my five little children. We had had our home destroyed and it's just been destruction ever since. You had once said to me, uh, and I've thought about this now for years, that homelessness is the worst kind of slavery. Could you expand on that and, and, and tell me what you meant by it? Because it's it's a condition by the masters. And if we are rejected by the plantations and forced after the Emancipation Proclamation, if we are forced off the plantations now and told that you don't have any homestead, any way of building a home. You don't have the 40 acres or nobody is not gonna give you no damn mule or nobody is not gonna give you no tractor, or give you no benefits or no grants opportunities to uh, get what you need to become sufficiently uh, self-supportive. That's the worst, uh, mm -hmm face of slavery that I ever could see. I'm not trying to say, uh, get over it. We are, we are now in the 20th century with the 2020 and we have all these other new technical reasons to celebrate, but that doesn't mean nothing to a lot of people. The reasons to celebrate doesn't mean anything when they're homeless. It's almost like you got not, you don't, you got something worse than the whip. Uh, you got what's something worse than the, the noose around our neck now. It's, you got them in the quicksand fields of stupidity and they're dying now. Uh, are there any pieces specifically in the displacement show which re reflect or, or reflect your idea of the slave past? Well, if you, oh, look, at, you, you look at mostly yeah. all of these pieces, all of these pieces mm -hmm. has something to do from the flag that's being mended by so many different uh, threads. Uh, we are mm -hmm. the three. We are the different colors of three. We, we bring the nation together no matter who we are, it doesn't mean, my thing I was singing today about pigmentation uh, without skin. If I had went to my grandmother, uh, well, I was born uh, out of my mother's womb and then I didn't have any skin. How would I would have appeared to my grandmother when she held her hand out to hold me and know that I'm her grandson and she's trying to figure out is this my son's baby? He don't have no skin. But if you look at the flag and the terrors in the flag, didn't we all 
take the time to struggle to make sure that the flag was mended and could keep flying in the nation. Didn't this nation need every hand, need every brain to matter? Not not only just the educated brain, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to scream out about highly educated brain, but examples was my grandpa that didn't have that much of reading and writing skills. My grandmother that didn't have that much of reading and writing skills, they was on the plantation. They were sharecroppers, but they still was examples because they knew what seed went where. A lot of people right now, and I don't want everybody to say I'm a liar, just put a bunch of people out there in the field right now and give them a, a million or a billion seeds to plant and just let them go, let them go and see how much the crop will grow because they don't even know how to hold the seed and they don't know the depths to put the seed in. So our grandparents was smarter than we thought they were. I, 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 I even just coming in from slavery, they were smart. Now move, move to the next uh, slide if you don't mind. That one there, the journal, the journal, every day they read about what was going on in the midst of us. But what was going on, the control that was going on. Look at the billy sticks that was in there and they still use billy sticks. Now the billy sticks have electrical power on the end of them or they have a, a taser. Instead, they don't, they don't use billy sticks no more. They got tasers that almost, uh, and you don't know what, what did I have a weak heart? You just tased me three times. Uh, and then you took the stick later and knocked me out. Or you put your knee on my neck and didn't even now know my medical condition. The journal is the news away uh, about us, but the treatment uh, is the sticks themselves. Move to the next one. This one is about sold out. Slavery might have been uh, considered to be sold out, but we got more. We got more. We got more people that is waiting for another era of slavery. We got to have bigger ropes now. The rope that is around yeah. the little cat's neck, it, it seemed to be, wow, so heavy he can't even bear the burden of that. He's on a pedestal. My thing is, are we put on a pedestal of stupidity and then looked at as the people that don't want to learn because we regret or we reject America's way of learning us because of what was done to our ancestors? I say to humans, let's get beyond that and understand that we need to digitally. When I say it all run the truth, internal self or art is life, don't kill it. I meant that art is life, don't kill it. Those are works of art that enhances us or inspires us to move beyond being on that pedestal and being sold over and over and over and over again. What strikes me is, is how absent, though the absence of anger in your art. I mean, I think your understanding of the history is, is spot on. And, and how you respond to it emotionally is not with anger, but is something uh, extremely constructive, though anger could, could be constructive too. One thing, uh, let's could we go back briefly to defiance, to the, uh, to the, yes, the piece of the flag. What is so, to me, so incredibly interesting about this is how domesticated, in a way, the uh, flag has become. And it, it almost, and what, where, the, where the, the word and where the defiance comes in is, it's, it's not, the flag isn't being uh, blown, th shown or blown in, in anybody's face. Uh, in, in fact, um, it almost defies, and here's the idea of defiance, it defies the sort of hysterical use of the flag by people I would call sort of insecure patriots kind of outside of, uh, outside of uh, 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 this room. Um, 
and and going and going. Let's hey, hey, go to, hey, before yeah. you start further, let me explain something. This yeah. wouldn't have even came about if it had not been for an accident that occurred. I was up in New Hampshire, and I was up there with a uh, match young lady, a girlfriend. And she was trying to move her scooter out of the barn. And she accidentally knocked over this little thing that had all the threads on it that you see on now. And it had all the threads that you see down on the flag. And actually, it was that mistake that stupefied my thoughts about this particular piece, it enhanced it to the max because all the threads just fell all over to where you see them at. And I said, wow, quickly bring me the needle and let me put all of these colors of thread. Let me thread up all these needles to sew up all of these tears in this flag and then it was almost like it was an act of collaboration, but sometimes we see things in America as mistakes. But I don't think the spirit make no mistakes. When it chooses us to do things, it do things that it know that we're going to turn out to benefit it the best. Spiritually, we're in America as an example nation. And if we don't continue, continue on that path of being the greatest that we can be, I think Muhammad Ali said, I'm the greatest. Uh, Dr. King said, be the best that you can be. There's a whole lot of other people that had trained us or left words to motivate us. Uh, I think it was uh, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, said, ask not. Uh, uh, all the time, America, give me, give me food, give me water. Uh, let me ask America, is there a way that I can work with you, America, and find better sources of water, better sources of feeding my uh, uh, homeless people, better sources of coming together like five fingers on a hand and working together to make these things grander than they ever have been. I, I don't want preachers to be getting upset with me uh, and thinking that I'm trying to be better than them because that flag represents this nation. And if we can't be the threads and strong threads there is, we gotta be the strong threads. And we know that we're gonna get stuck by those needles every now and then just threading them along. And if we don't have no thimbles, and most of the women uh, that did quilting and things, most of those women did not have uh, uh, thimbles. They found some little rock or something and made their thimbles out of it in the early yes. age of America. I, th I think of the women uh, who used um, spoons and, and the, um, the handles of spoons to uh, as their sewing tools uh, in our great kind of a, a sweet grass baskets in the low country. Uh, and that brings to mind another quote of, of, of yours, which you have, uh, I think, nicely borrowed from Malcolm X, which is by any means necessary. And, by any means necessary. Uh, why, yeah, should I, yeah. why should I, why should I'm always thinking about weapons when my grandfather yeah. And my great grandfather left me a little piece of land that they have. I'm not a greedy person. It's not about money. It's not about material things. But when we know that there's a zillion rocks on that, on on that uh, five or ten acres, do can we take those rocks? Uh, it, it say by before this earth pass away, I'll make a stone speak for me. Let's take those stones. Let's teach our children how to be grateful for e each little bud that's that blossoms in the spring on a tree. Let them know that there is gonna be a time when that is gonna turn into a piece of fruit. Let them not see the fruit being wasted because they just sit around and, and, and think that everything is so boring because they are not uh, tech, uh, tech, 
technically, tech, tech, technically, whatever you call it, savvy. Yeah, digitally savvy. K Katie, could you move the uh, to uh, the piece the threads that hold us to, that held us together, which I think brings together a lot of the themes that Lonnie's been talking about, and this is a a piece of some sort of a you know the, the sewing machine. Uh, is an icon of uh, domestic life. But what's happened to the sewing machine here, Lonnie? This sewing machine been burned out. This was Mary McCarthy's home. It had got burned out. She had got burned out. This is a quilt that was burned up. This was a box that contained some of the, some of the material that she brought and gave me. She said, I, I, think, I think Lonnie could use this. When I saw it, I said, yes, I could use it. I became, I, I became so happy with it because I knew that this sewing machine would never, ever be able to work again. But just because of all the work that it has done, just because of all the work that these old women have done, all of our grandmothers and great grandmothers, what they have done, how they labored day after day. And this is electrical sewing machine but did, did you see burnt the burnt wood i wanted to show every part of that occurrence where she lost her home and then had had to depend on making other means this is a yeah. by any means necessary piece and this means <laughs> is to show us a good example of how I, our struggle should not end in damaged goods. But it's also, that means it's also, but it's also a great example of your method as an artist of taking pieces that to other people are trash. Uh, to other people, this would be just discarded and thrown away. And in your hands, and uh, especially held together by uh, all of these threads, it becomes a really powerful uh, work of art. And I could say something that I'd like to have in my house, um, you know, a, but a sign of sort of a domestic ruin in one place, but of uh, this great, you know, tremendous potential uh, that but domestic Ted, life Ted, had. Ted is in our house. We got to realize um, when something go into a museum, when something is put into a way of being preserved. America is our house. It belongs to us. The White well, that's, House that's belongs to us. Not, the that's certainly what in Washington, D.C. belongs to us. It's all those humans that have paid and died and left that as an endowment or a what? As an inheritance for us. We, we make a mistake when we, when we let somebody be elected and not keep them on their promises. You know, we chose you all to sit here. Now you all are our, I'm not trying to say, I don't want to say every president should uh, wheel down and let us make a puppet of them, but they should make a puppet of themselves. They should say, I am your puppet. Now do as you will with me. Every artist that's in America that really, really want to have their works in the United Nations or in the Smithsonian or any other museum or any other place like that, we got to see ourselves in a soldierly manner. We got to see ourselves representing, representing America. How the Institute is representing America. From what this you learned about me, Ted, you came to the South and you went, we went all the way down to where my grandfather, Willie Holly, worked. And all them rivers, I told you, I, I did a song called The Many Rivers to Cross. How many mm -hmm. rivers they had to cross with a mule and a wagon. I ain't talking about it. it wasn't no cars and trucks back there in the twenties and the thirties for a lot of Negroes. They did it with the mule and a wagon. They had to find a, a, a face in the river that they could cross. 
So Daveville, Alabama, Camp Hill, Alabama, we went down there. Boy. Didn't we went down there? Am I telling a lie? Yeah, we, had, we had a great time. That was uh, that was really incredible. Did, what now, what this, happened? This piece, what happened? Listen, listen. What happened when you went to this man, Mr. Harley, Frank Harley? <laughs> what what happened when we went to his house and knocked on his door? Tell 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 the world about that. All right, I'll tell you a little bit. Um, first of all, we came to this man's house, and Mr. Holly, Frank Holly, uh, lived way in the back of beyond. And, but he wasn't a, a kind of a quaint old man. This is a man who had two master's degrees, a master's degree from Auburn, a master's degree from Kansas State University, had been a school principal. And we knocked on his door one morning early because Lonnie was tracing his Holly roots. And through a number of connections and with Matt, uh, Arnett, uh, we, we knocked on Holly's door and the first thing he said was come in. He didn't ask who we were or what, please come in. But the amazing thing about that morning for me, especially, is he was sitting in his pajamas uh, at the kitchen table and he had in his hand a sheaf of papers. And Lonnie, uh, Matt introduced himself, Lonnie introduced himself saying, this is what I've come for. And I was about to say, and my name is, and he said, stop. Don't tell me your name, I know who you are. I said, whoa, you know who I am. And what he was holding in his hand was a college th thesis that Dale, who at that wrote uh, in the uh, late 1960s at Harvard University on something called the Alabama Sharecroppers Union. So there's a radical organization of poor farmers in this part of Alabama. And somehow or other, the morning that we show up at Frank Holly's house, he has the only copy of this in the state of Alabama is in his hands and he's reading it. And he said, you are uh, Ted Rosengarten. And, and I mean, we all could have dropped it. And he sent us across the road to visit his sister. And his sister at the time was holding a meeting of people uh, who had been a committee that gave scholarships to promising high school students going off to college. And they were closing down the scholarship because the high school had closed and had uh, consolidated with the high school in Dadeville with another high school. But Lonnie, this was beautiful. Lonnie sensing, oh, this is an audience. This is not just a meeting of these people proceeded to tell his story. And meanwhile, we look over across the room and there in a walled up fireplace is a stack of quilts. And it was Matt and Matt's father who in some way uncovered, I wouldn't say discovered, but uncovered uh, the work of the quilters of G's Bend, Alabama some years before. And um, uh, Frank Holly's wife, uh, sister rather, allowed us to take those uh, quilts outside and hold them up and look at them. You know, it's uh, just an amazing day of a coincidence um, of, of people um, and it's centered around, for me, it's centered around the story that Lonnie was telling and was trying to learn at the same time, kind of the story of, of the Hollies. And that was only one great incident. I want to tell one little story on you, though, about uh, an incident later in that day. And I mean, there was one after another. We'd gone back to Birmingham. And in Birmingham, Lonnie wanted to take us, Matt and me, to the place where the house stood, where he had been a boy. Um, and, 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 and not a lot had changed. The road was there. Behind the side of the house was a great ditch, uh, a ditch that Lonnie as a boy had gone into and would find materials um, that really kind of excited him and excited his imagination. And we got there and the house was gone and in its place was a, a childcare center, a daycare center but we didn't know what was going on. Lonnie went immediately into the ditch and we tried to hold him back, but no, he went into the ditch and he's down in the ditch and we were making a, a little noise. And a woman comes out from the center and she's the director, uh, I, I will say dressed to the nines or so, a very appealing person. She says, what's going on here? We said, what's going on? I said, don't, no, don't call the police. You know, with all that, you know, she, don't, don't, don't. There's an artist in the ditch. And he's, she said, what? is an artist in the ditch. What are you talking about? Who is that? I said, well, his name is Lonnie Holly. And she said, Lonnie Holly. 
Well, I just saw some of his work at the Birmingham Museum. And, Lon and we, we managed to get Lonnie out of the ditch. And he had, sure enough, he had collected stuff. And, and uh, it was late in the afternoon. And I'm sure the, uh, uh, the teachers in this uh, center, the uh, caregivers were uh, already a little bit tired, a little bit, uh, you know, not knowing what to do next with the children. And, and she said, will you come in and will you talk to the children? And Lonnie went inside and uh, for, got all the children to sit around him and uh, uh, ask for some paper and scissor and began cutting out these beautiful profiles of the people who were in the room. And he had those children just spellbound. And about that time, their mothers, uh, primarily mothers, uh, came, were coming to pick up their children. And he got them spellbound as well. And uh, I don't think, I think I had been caught with anybody who had the charisma to do that since I had gone to Alabama in the 1960s and uh, had interviewed with Dale, had interviewed Ned Cobb, uh, one of the uh, uh, founders of that sharecroppers movement in that time. Um, that was a great day for us, but we also visited the site of the Birmingham airport from where Lonnie, where Lonnie had been um, evicted. Um, very, very powerful. Lonnie, would you tell us a little bit about um, your mother, your relationship with your mother, and what, in what way that influenced, influenced your art, but primarily about her life and, and, and what she was noted for? Well, when I was one and a half, this woman that's supposed to have been an Easter star sister of my mother's took me away, well, in, in support of my mother having, mama had 27 children out of 32 pregnancies. 27, yeah, 27 children, yeah. 27 of us lived it. So mama was having a child almost every year or either every year and a half mama had a new baby. So at the time mama just had had a baby and then I, I came in as the baby and I'm sure she didn't have enough milk. And this other, this other woman took me, breastfeed me and took me away. And in and, and the process of that, the woman that took me away was a brulette dancer. And right where we were just discussing in that ditch, no more than a block and a half were the state fairground. No more than a block and a half. So my life and what I introduced you to were parts of my life. There on Long Avenue where I went down in that ditch, where, right there where that house where the daycare center was. And I'm, I'm so proud of the spiritual energy of teaching or how one would say uh, the McElroy's house or where Tonky McElroy would, would have lived and slept. Now is a daycare That's center. Him, Tonky McElroy. This is Tonky McElroy right here. And, and wh wh when, did, when did you know that you were Lonnie Holly? How does Tonky McElroy Lonnie come Holly to be? Until I, I was turning, getting ready to turn 15 years old. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. Wow. I really didn't know who I were until I was getting ready to turn 15 years old. And then that was, uh, my grandmama came and got me out of Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children. And that was a, a more like a slave camp uh, for children uh, in Alabama. And I, that's, that, that's, a, that's part of your story also too. I hope that you all get a chance to read uh, the Halsey Institute book that was written for uh, something to take my place wasn't that the title of it wasn't yes. it? Yes, yes, yes. Um, that, that brings up something I wanted to ask you about the influence of different people in your life. For example, Mark Sloan, I'm a director of the uh, Halsey Institute um, and, and Bill Arnett as well, whom you've already mentioned uh, as being a kind of a uh, a patron, but more than a patron, a believer in you and a believer in your work. And what about the influence of, for example- I, I, think, I, I think those people that allowed us in America to understand how material can talk, how material I'm has clear. a voice, how material uh, of someone that has been left behind 
uh, if you don't throw it away, uh, how it can actually do uh, a fundamental value or revaluing our intent. And Mark uh, is that type of director. He, he saw that. Not only did he get off of his pedestal, a lot of times, uh, and <laughs> I, I scream out to every um, director, not just send the curator, but some of the directors need to visit our landmarks. They need to get out and see what's happening in America in order to make a, a greater presentation of information because everything is gonna be turned into digital information one way or the other. Yes. And my yeah. thing is I'm just crying that we be so foolish to think that it's, it's gotta be everything pretty. Everything, it doesn't need to be pretty. Don't sugarcoat it or don't whitewash it as I would say. They whitewashed it, the stones and the trees down there in Alabama Industrial School uh, where after they got through whooping us, they can see our blood on every stone in every tree that we touch. They had whitewashed it just to, as an example. Sometimes whitewashing is an example of taking what you have and taking away your true identity and whitewash you to death. No, you had you had mentioned, of course, the uh, uh, Mount Meg School for uh, the Alabama School for Negro Children. What kind of education was carried on at Mount Meg's? To some, you, you weren't um, there because you were a good to boy. Some, listen to me. To some, there was no schooling. To no schooling. some, there was no schooling. But listen, I learned because I'm I'm just. It's, Matt, Matt and, and Paul and Bill and uh, uh, everybody that I've met say, Lonnie, you have always been different. I, I am different. I, one say self-made, but yeah. I'm self-concerned. I just had pulled up uh, a piece, I did it today, and I think I, I posted it on Facebook where my curiosity and my creativity learned to balance each other. On one end of the scale was my curiosity. And on the other end of the scale was my creativity. In the middle of the scale, the scale itself was my skills. So if we learn to do that, if we learn to balance that and balance it as well as we possibly can, Ted, you know, how much people de believe on what you have written and how you have written it. And I know that it took you to get the information out there that people could understand it. It took Bill Arnett, William Arnett, to see these pieces of material. You, you see what I'm talking about? I'm picking up the mouse right now. This the mouse. A lot of people don't put the mouse out the house. They don't even have a mouse on that computer anymore. They put the mouse out the house. So they don't need to click the mouse so they can just use one finger and get everything mostly done. We are in a changing period of time. Digitally, it's by the flip flip, not the tick tick any longer. Tick tock. It doesn't work for a lot of people no more. It's flip flip. And I call it flip flip the digital identity of time. You had used the word you call yourself self made. Yet when the, when the when the term self made is applied to artists, it's often a pejorative. It's often a, a, almost an insult. The self made artist, the outsider artist, you know, and all the names that have been given to people who haven't had formal art education and it doesn't um, it doesn't you worry me hey, it doesn't worry me because if i don't drive myself who's gonna drive me who's gonna if myself don't tell me to get up and i don't listen to myself who am i gonna listen to ain't nobody gonna call me up every morning and say lonnie get out of the bed lonnie go online post something and let everybody know that you are all right, you're fine. You post something, 
you do you do your digital art. I do my digital art, and somebody had told me, say you doing all that, all that shit. Excuse me, I'm a grown man. You doing all that shit in vain. It ain't nothing gonna do nothing but go to the junkyard. Somebody gonna uh, end up taking it or whatever else. I, I know that. It mostly everything, and that's the most hurting thing that I ever had to go through was to see thousands of my pieces bulldozed that day. And mm. y'all saw that, and and y'all saw that in uh, artist life. Don't kill it. Uh, you could have saw a lot, lot more. But uh, the, the, my children was crying. Daddy, what are we going to do now? Uh, and, and then when mm. we did move, we moved into a hunter's nest of people that didn't like us for one thing and didn't understand us for, for two things and crushed it the rest of the art that I, if you go where I was in Hoppersville, Alabama now, and we yeah. walk through, I call it a cemetery of art. Yeah, we walk through that with me. They just don't ran over it. It, it just don't crush it all. I had some wonderful pieces there. And they just crushed them all to pieces because they, they my children share parents because of lack of understanding. Wow. Katie, you were raising a hand. What does that mean? It means that I'm I'm so sad to have to pop in and um and start to draw the conversation to a close. If you have one more question, Ted, uh for, for I, Lonnie, I would say or, I would say we just started. I know. Uh, <laughs> my, my question goes back actually to uh, Lonnie's relationship with other artists, people who are, you know, when Lonnie goes to, to Europe, well, Lonnie goes out to, to outside of the United States, he's not one of these, uh, he's not a self-taught artist or this artist, he's an artist, you know, and I'm thinking about kind of the reputation of Thornton Dial, of Purvis Young, and also of Purvis's homelessness, uh, and I want you to tell the story about uh, being in, in going being in a hotel with Purvis and, and uh, how he decided hotel, not to spend the night I, I, in the room. I think some of us has grown to live with our conditions and knew that we was going to have to die with those conditions. I think that Mr. Dow yeah. lived it with uh, uh, his upbringing and people and he like- he buried his art. He buried his art in the ground. He buried his art Before because people, people made fun of it. But Mr. Dow- But he didn't know it was art. Mr. Dow had worked with the shanty houses. He had worked with the tin houses and the, just the, the mech do of, of living condition. What we are talking about now is the house, the house that we live in. And the main house that we live in is the body that that we, the, that we share with each other. That's the main house that we live in. It got two windows. It's got another set of windows, but they can be opened up and closed. They call them ears. It's got another big window that we open and close. It calls our mouth. Our nose is just windows. But the whole thing about living in this world, and right now, that is most hurting thing that I can think about is to know that there's a lot of those humans that is homeless, that don't have a way, uh, people that doesn't have HD TV, or HD radio, or computers in their homes, that is soon to be put out because they don't know what the crisis of the coronavirus, if I misspeak pronounce that, y'all know what I'm talking about, the virus has caused the closing down of the way of us getting wealth or to, to having a job or getting backwards and forwards. It, it just, uh, it's a pity. It's a, it, it is a pity. And, and homes without computers and children without schools who go to homes without computers are screwed. And it's, a, a you know, one of the there's no doubt about That's it. The children the are the biggest casualties. A home, without, a home yeah. without computers, a home without a HD accessibility. That's uh, America. Please, 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 please. If I could say it a zillion times, please understand. If we're moving into the digital 
Let's do it just and right as Dr. King spoke. Just and right. Not, not just right. A lot of people say, just right. Yeah, oh, baby, you, you, you make me feel just right. No, no, just and right. Justifiably right. Ted. Lonnie, thank, I, we got, thank you, my man. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, really, I, I, I say every time I, I hate to have to jump in um, and, and take questions and draw the event to a close, but I, I mean it every time. And I, I know um, we could spin off into so many other really meaningful, meaningful subjects. So thank you so much for sharing all of this with us tonight. But I do encourage you tonight, uh, if you have uh, questions for Lonnie and Ted, again, you can submit them in the Facebook comments or email them to halsey at cfc.edu. And I, I wanted to speak, Lonnie, something you said um, earlier in your, your talk with, with Ted was that not knowing who you are that this was a form, um, you know, not knowing who you are or not, not knowing your identity or having your identity whitewashed in some way, your identity taken from you, um, that that is a form of displacement and um, perhaps a, a form of homelessness too, right? That you're, you're not rooted in, in who you are. Yeah. So I wondered if you could speak more to that concept. Wasn't slavery a homeless situation? They took them from their home, brought them across the water. A lot of them was thrown off on the different islands and everything. Uh, uh, so we 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 won't don't stop there. Let's let's really really put it in the category that it need to be put into. And we wasn't given any other land. We wasn't even getting nowhere to build no other mm -hmm. uh, happy. We wasn't given nowhere to build our happy home. Nowhere to build them, baby. I think too, you know, something that has has long uh, obviously been an issue, but is now being discussed anew, perhaps, is the idea of generational poverty. So this idea of you know people not passing on land or passing on wealth um, to being able to pass that on to to ancestors, and something um, that I think you you and Ted have touched on as well, also being a form of displacement in, in a sense. So not having this being removed from the same type of opportunities uh, and the ability to have the same type of home, whatever that may be, that fellow Americans perhaps you know get to enjoy. If we are an offering to the Lord, as they would say, we are an offering to God, or we are an offering to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are the offering to our ancestors, uh, then what we are going through, how we are sacrificing, how we are making, uh, uh, doing, making do as examples uh, all, all along the coastline, just like Ted was telling you about the basket weavers uh, there in the Carolinas, how they make do with just the grass. We make do. Yeah. We yeah. make do by any means necessary. We gonna do. But the whole thing is, is that our children, and I was just reading the other day where Proverbs, of African Proverbs, where if we uh, disrespect our ancestors, then our, our children will disrespect us. Our, our grandchildren will disrespect their mothers and fathers just because we don't pay the proper respect that we should pay to the ancestors because they labor, they blood, sweat, and tears are in the soil of America. And if we can do anything by bowing down on that soil and kissing that soil sometime and saying, oh, sweet soil, how sweet it is. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I wonder this question why, for why it's so much, so much fun to hang around with this guy. I know I've written I've written so many things down, uh, Lonnie. That yeah. you're you're full of very of great quotes and, and wisdom and nuggets to think about later. Um, and but the, I have a question too for you, Ted, and for you, Lonnie. So you two, you've had a years long relationship, and you've discussed many personal details. You know, Lonnie, you told Ted your life story. You went on this trip together. Um, but now you've come together again professionally for the Displacements Project and to discuss 
home. And I wonder what that's like to, to have kind of a charge to discuss this one specific thing that means so many things, especially now when we're all stuck at home, right? Or, or protected by our home, at, perhaps um, during the pandemic. It, it, it get kind of, my, my oldest brother said, don't let it get fishy on you. Cause a fish will get on the hook. And then if you ain't careful, that fish will get off the hook. Don't let it get fishy on you. Because if you look at the economy and how the economy of America is pretty well set up. You could lose your home in, in the flick of an eye. Uh, people are losing their homes right now as I speak. And then there is no way to get their homes back. I'm not trying to say whoever was over uh, or, or what they call that thing when, when, uh, when storms and hurricanes and things. Uh, FEMA, I, I don't, I don't want to blame everything on FEMA. I don't want to blame everything on other educationable uh, projects that had been set up in the government to protect us after storms and things come through. But there are certain places that belongs to America has people have been left homeless for years yes. and, and yes. they haven't gotten no home yet. I'm sorry to have to remind us of all the tragedies and everything like that. But what I'm trying to remind us is that there are babies out there that need water. They need food. They need clothes. Otherwise, their peer level is gonna make fun of them. They're gonna, they're gonna stress them to death. Stress is something, one of the hardest abuses to wear is stress. I'm sorry to had to say it, but that's it. I, I, I'm, I'm moved, I was very moved by the opportunity to talk about homelessness and uprootedness. And, and, and certainly one of the things COVID has done is to uh, uproot us from our routines. And that's been very painful and continues to be extremely painful. Uh, for me. And one of the things my son Rafe was saying today is that COVID is gonna end up being sort of the, uh, uh, the cause of one of the greatest transfers of wealth in world history, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And uh, we can talk about our homes, um, but that, that's finally the reality of the day. Uh, and I think that comes through very, and very strong. You can't strongly. call COVID no devil. You can't call COVID no devil, and you can't say that it was sent by God. You understand what I'm saying? This yeah. is something that came out of a laboratory. This is something well, that is grown. I mean, whatever, whatever way it got here, it's here. Yeah, the, what's coming out of the laboratory yeah, next yeah, is going to save us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, I keep on buttoning. But. <laughs> yeah, you keep on buttoning. <laughs> How did you button into your own conversation? No, this is this has been so <laughs> so great and. Um, as you say, Lonnie, it is important for us to remember that there are people suffering down the road from where everyone sits viewing, viewing this talk tonight. You know, I think often we think of inhumane suffering happening in a place far, far away. But uh, of course, yes, suffering happening every day on every unimaginable level. And um, but this has been this has been so, so great. And I've learned so much from you, too. And I, I could just, we could go on for three more hours and I'd write down so many more quotes, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but I, I really appreciate the time that you've given and all the thoughts that you've shared, shared with well, us. I appreciate, I appreciate you and the, uh, your, your tremendous patience in this project, especially with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's been, it's really been a pleasure and um, working with everybody in this, in the project, 19 other people, uh, in this project, the artists and the respondents, everybody has such a unique vision, unique view and unique lens on home uh, through your artwork, Lonnie, through Ted's words in response to it, through your words tonight. So it's been a real pleasure for me. Great. But, and for those at home, I, I wanna remind you, so this evening's talk between Lonnie Holly and Ted Rosengarten was the 10th and final installment in the Halsey Institute's Displacements Conversation Series. 
Displacements can continue to be viewed at displacements.org, even as we officially close programming for the exhibition. Lonnie and Ted are our, our swan song for programming, but the website will live on. Thank you to all of you who have joined us for these conversations. I have learned so much and I hope that you have as well. We hope to see you, our Halsey members and fans, masked and socially distanced when we reopen on January 15th with our latest exhibition, Geolocation, featuring the work of Larson Schindelman. Check out the website and follow our social media to put the dates of our virtual events on your calendar. We'll all continue to get better at Zoom every time we log in. But here's wishing continued health and happiness to you and your home, wherever and whatever that may be. Thank you so much. And, and happy holidays. Happy holidays and thumbs up to you all. Thanks, Ted. Okay, Lonnie.